morning. Welcome to worship with Tibbetts United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Sarah, a joy and gift to gather and be in the presence of God and one another uh, this morning. We are in the season of Easter. Uh, if you were out to brunch last week and you missed church, um, the tomb was empty. Jesus rose again. And now we stand in this uh, post-resurrection time and season where uh, just like the disciples as they encountered uh, the empty tomb, they asked themselves the question, now what? What happens after we experience that promise of new life? What does that mean for who we are and how we move and live and be in the world? So this morning, um, we're going to be trying a couple things uh, to help us uh, access access that inner voice to help us grow uh, in spirit and in love, uh, things that actually require you to get up and move if you're joining us in the, in the sanctuary, things that invite you, not a requirement, but you'll be invited to talk to each other. And if that makes you nervous, it's okay. You don't have to. It's an invitation. You're allowed to decline, right, the invitation. Uh, but the purpose of this is for us uh, to practice being in community through worship in different ways, in ways that we don't do every single Sunday. Because the thing is, resurrection is a big deal. And when resurrection hap happens, it calls us to be different in the world, to be different in our relationship with each other, to try new things as we uh, get the lay of the land, this uncharted territory of post-resurrection. So that's some of the things uh, we have in store for us this morning in the service. If you're joining us online, our chat monitor this morning is Carolyn, and she has uh, some links for you to the questions that uh, we'll be reflecting on together, and so I invite you to take a look at that. And if you watch online um, and you don't know how to access the chat, do not have your uh, YouTube in full screen, because we found that if you're in full screen, you can't see the chat, so little uh, point there. Hopefully that's helpful to you. If this is your first time here, uh, we have a yellow connect card in the back of the pew in front of you. We invite you to take a moment, fill that out, and you can drop it in the offering plate later in the service. And if you're joining us online, we have a link to a connect card. It's just a way for us to be in touch with you. Uh, reach out, learn about who you are, what it is you need and are looking for in a faith community, and what gifts uh, you might bring and offer here. And your presence with us this morning is a gift. We also have prayer cards in the back of the pew in front of you. If you have a joy or concern you'd like to share, you can fill that out. And if you're joining us online, you can drop your prayer requests in the chat, and uh, we'll be sure to include them later in the service. We're going to break bread together this morning. We're going to serve each other a communion. And so you'll be invited uh, to come up and receive the bread and cup later in the service. And if you're joining us online, now is a great time uh, to find some crackers, or juice so that you can also partake in communion. So we've been uh, practicing every week, connecting with one another, uh, greeting each other, and it's particularly important this morning because of what we're going to be doing later in the service. So um, actually when I was workshopping some of the elements of this service uh, with my husband, he said, oh, since we're going to be interactive later in the service, does that mean we're not going to do the, the greeting at the beginning? And I said, well, no, we have to do both. And here's why. See, so he, he sharpens me for you, so you should thank him. Here's why. Because then you know who is here. Then you've already looked at the faces and people around you. You have a sense of awareness of where you are, where other people are sitting. And this morning, uh, if you find yourself sitting alone and you're good with that, great. But if you see someone sitting alone and you go up to them and invite them to sit with you or invite them to engage in these discussion, conversation questions, uh, they are allowed to say no. But for those of you who don't want to participate, we're still allowed to ask you if you want to. Is everyone good with that? Do you get what I'm saying? So, so we, I want us to be particularly aware of who is present this morning. And so if you're joining us online, the same goes for you. Who is watching this service with you? So now is a time for you to introduce yourself in the chat, maybe say where you're watching from, but just connect with the people who are worshiping online. So if you're here in person, I invite you uh, to stand and turn to your neighbor and connect. 
Look them in the eye, welcome them, greet them, shake their hand, give them a high five, just connect with the people around you. Let's greet each other with the peace of Christ. Make your way back to your seats, make your way back to your seats. And I would like to invite any children among us to join me for the time for young disciples. Are there any big kids here? Are there any kids here who want to come up and join me? I see one. I see two. Come on up. Come on up. Have a seat. Oh, all gone. Hi, welcome. It is so nice to see you. I am so glad you are here. So, yes, yes. Um, so, I have a question for you. What is your favorite song? What's your favorite song? What's your favorite song, Esther? Unicorn. Unicorn? <laughs> you, like, you love that song, Lights Out, from Unicorn Academy? If you haven't heard it, it's on Spotify. <laughs> What's your favorite song? Do you have a favorite song? A song you like to sing or listen to? What about you, Dia? What's your favorite song? Okay, it doesn't have to be your absolute favorite. It could just be a song you love. Uh, I like uh, U2. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. You 2 still haven't found what I'm looking for. What are some of your favorite songs? Do you people listen to music? <laughs> Black, I do. Blackbird. I'm a Swifty. Oh, we got a Swifty. Any other Swifties in the house? Oh, yeah. What are your What are your favorite songs? What are your favorite songs? I really like Four Non Blondes. What's up? This song's for you. This song's for you. What else? Somewhere over the rainbow. Imagine. Wait. Like a virgin, I will die for you. Who sings that? Prince, thank you. Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. Born to Run? Born to Run. Say that again. Hilo's Telephone Line? Clearly, I don't know that one. The Electric Light Orchestra's Telephone Line. We should, we should, say that again. This ain't my mama's broken heart. Any other country fans? Happy birthday, 
happy. The river flows in you. And Davida Degada. <laughs> Apparently, you got some friends here. What? And and butterfly. Okay, I think we. I clearly I can't hear well, which does not bode well for later in the service. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, but maybe we need a playlist of all of our favorite songs. Cause didn't didn't you just learn something about each other? Didn't you? Well, I want to tell you this morning, did you think of a favorite song? Do you think of a favorite song? Well, this morning, we are going to sing uh, someone's favorite song. There is a member of this church, and her name is Floy. And Floy worships every Sunday at home. She worships every Sunday at home, and she watches the live stream, or she watches the service recording. And she has been requesting that we sing her favorite song for like six months or longer, maybe longer. So, so Floy loves this song. It's one of her favorite songs, and it's a song called In the Garden. And it's an, it's a, it's an older song, and you know what? Let's see, it's from 1913. Wow! It's as old as this church. We were founded in 1909, so it's an older song. Um, but, but Floy loves this song, and as I was reading the lyrics, it's about being in the garden and experiencing Jesus walking with us. It's about knowing that we are not alone and that Christ is with us. And so this morning, we are going to sing Floy's favorite song, and we're going to sing it to her. So I would invite the congregation to stand, and the words are going to be on the screens. And, okay, thank you. Um, and young disciples, I invite you to go back to your seat for this song, and then you can head to Sunday school if you'd like after we sing it. But congregation, the first thing that I'd, I'd like you all to do um, is just wave to Floyd, okay? And there's a camera up here. So all you got to do is look up here and wave. Oh, over there, right there. Hi, Floyd. Everybody say hi. Hi, Floyd. We love you, we miss you, and this one's for you. And we're gonna sing this the best we have ever sang any hymn ever, because it's your favorite song. I invite you to join us as we sing In the Garden, Floyd's Fave. Let's sing.
Will you pray with me? Oh God, thank you for the joy that we share as we encounter and experience the risen Christ for ourselves. Thank you for the gift of music that anchors us and speaks to us, the timeless sound of your voice. Bless us that through the notes we sing this morning, we would hear you call us by name, just like you called Mary by name in the garden that first Easter morning. In your holy name we pray, amen. Amen. Young disciples, you're invited to head to Sunday school. Teacher Sarah's there. We also have nursery care for anybody that might need it. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I want to grab your stuffy. The Gospel reading is from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. In the evening of that same day, the first day of the week, the doors were locked in the room where the disciples were for fear of the temple authorities. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Having said this, the Savior showed them the marks of crucifixion. The disciples were filled with joy when they saw Jesus. They said, who said to them again, peace be with you, as Abba God sent you, sent me, so I'm sending you. After saying this, Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you retain anyone's sins, they are retained. It happened that one of the twelve, Thomas, nicknamed Didymus, or twin, was absent when Jesus came. The other disciples kept telling him, we've seen Jesus. Thomas' answer was, I'll never believe it without putting my finger in the nail marks and my hand into the spear wound. On the eighth day, the disciples were once more in the room, and this time Thomas was with them. Despite the locked doors, Jesus came and stood before them saying, Peace be with you. Then to Thomas, Jesus said, Take your finger and examine my hand. Put your hand into my side. Don't persist in your unbelief, but believe. Thomas said in response, my Savior and my God. Jesus then said, you become a believer because you saw me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs as well, signs not recorded here in the presence of the disciples. But these have been recorded to help you believe that Jesus is the Messiah the only begotten, so that by believing you may have life in Jesus' name. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Amen. Thank you, Carrie. I forgot to mention, for those of you worshiping in person, um, as you picked up the order of worship, there was a half sheet of paper that has some questions on there that they're the questions that um, I'll be asking you to respond to in real time during the sermon. And they're also the questions that uh, are the prompts for each prayer station, which they're also at the prayer station, but if you want to know what's coming. So I'll invite our guides to grab those. And if anybody would like a copy of that, you can raise your hand. Didn't, didn't get on the screens. We've got a couple up here. So um, just so you, if you want to jot down some notes or just if you're visual person if it's helpful for you to look at that and read that. Wasn't that fun to sing to Floyd? That was fun. That was fun. Let's pray. 
May the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. We're going to open uh, with a question I'd like you to respond to. And that question is, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? What, what scares you? So I'll invite you to think about that for a minute. And I've got my, my scribe back here who's, okay, good, we're good to go. Okay, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Climate change. Nuclear war. Losing loved ones. Trump becoming president again. Being alone. Being under someone else's control. Failure, yes. What scares you? What are you afraid of? Mm -hmm. Your TV going out. That would be a tragedy for you because I know what a film buff you are. Yeah. Being unemployable. Not having enough money. Failure. Future earthquake. Anything else? What are you afraid of? Dying. Yeah, you got another one back there for dying, too. Yeah. Those of you who are joining us online, I invite you, um, if you'd like to write what you are afraid of, what scares you uh, in, in the chat. That first Easter morning, a Mary encounters the tomb and she calls Peter and the beloved disciple, and they discover that it's empty. The tomb is empty. And our scripture reading today tells us, uh, it begins with, on that same day. So I want you to have that uh, picture in your mind to help orient you to this story. So in the morning they discover the tomb is empty. Jesus appears to Mary, calls her by name. She recognizes the sound of his voice. And she knows, believes that he is in fact risen, alive in the flesh. And she runs and shares it with the disciples. But throughout the day, she's the only person that's seen Jesus standing there. Some of the other disciples saw the tomb was empty, but she's the only one. But that night, on the same day, that night, uh, the disciples locked themselves inside the house out of fear. They were afraid. They were afraid of the political and religious authorities who had killed Jesus. Which makes sense because they had been traveling around with Jesus. And so people knew that they were associated with him. But they were so afraid, so, so disoriented after uh, discovering the empty tomb that they locked themselves inside the house. Now, um, the question I have, will you, will, did you send me those responses? Can you do that? Um, the question that I have for you is, think about that thing that you're afraid of, that you just named. Think about that thing you're afraid of. And the question is, what do you do to avoid coming face to face with that fear? How do you hide from that thing that you are afraid of. Okay, we're gonna go through the we're gonna go through this list. How do you hide from the thing you're afraid of? Um, what do you do to avoid facing uh, the threat of climate change? Ignore it. Put your head down. Keep on going. It's someone else's problem. What about nuclear war? What do you do to avoid the fear? Don't watch the news. Yep, don't watch the news. What about the fear of losing loved ones? What do you do when you're afraid of losing a loved one? What do you do? 
spend more time with them. Pretend they're not as sick as they are. Maybe be in denial about the reality that they're facing of their illness. What about Trump being president? What do you do when you're being afraid of that? Write postcards. Write postcards? Go ahead. Pray for contingency. Make contingency plans. Make contingency plans. Yeah, yeah. What do you do um, uh, when you're afraid of being alone? What do you do when you're afraid of being alone? Maintain relationships. Rem remember that we're not alone. Seek out other people. Does anybody overextend themselves socially? Anybody do that because they're afraid of being alone? What about being under someone else's control? What do you do if you're afraid of being under someone else's control? Resist. Rebel. Assert yourself, assert your dominance, maybe. What about failure? What do you do when you're afraid to fail? What do you do? Nothing. You don't try? Yeah. So reflect on why you failed before and what you could have done differently or done better. Oh, become a workaholic. Yes, become a workaholic. Spend too much time at work trying to make up for that fear of, of failing. Uh, accept the fact that everyone fails, that everyone fails. Uh, ask your friends for help. Yes. See, you're way more positive than I was, so this is good. This is good. Um, let's see. Let's do one or two more here. Um, what about, what about dying? What do you do if you're afraid of dying? Live. Live. That's a good one. Live every day. Take better care of yourself. Take better care of yourself. Say that again. Doing less dangerous things. You're not going skydiving if you're afraid of dying, right? Being more cautious. Anything else? Jesus leads us to eternal life. Maybe you really have a deep dive into your faith, into your religious tradition. Our fear, our fear, it, it impacts how we move in the world. And the irony of the fact that the disciples were afraid, and so they locked themselves inside this house when Jesus had just bust out of the tomb. Do you see the irony in that? Here Jesus is alive, claiming freedom and liberation for all, and the disciples are so afraid that they hide. But here's the thing. There they are hiding. There they are allowing their fear to dictate their action. And it's there that Jesus appears to them behind that locked door of their fear. Man, you can run, but you can't hide. God's love and grace is ever present no matter where you are. No matter where you are, God's love, God's grace is there, is there with you. Now, uh, when we move to the time where you're invited to go to these prayer and reflection stations, you're going to have an opportunity to dive a little bit deeper into this uh, by responding to the prompt, uh, what do you hide? What do you hide from other people and why? And that prayer station is in the back right here. And you'll write what you hide on this piece of paper. And then we have a miniature tomb. And I invite you to place that, that thing that you hide, in that tomb. Jesus stood there among the disciples inside the locked house. And he said to them, peace be with you. There in their fear, he said, peace, my peace, the peace that passes all understanding 
be with you. Isn't it comforting to know that Christ brings us peace even when we are locked inside the self-made tombs of fear and guilt and shame and regret? But here's the thing. Thomas was out to lunch. Thomas was not there. And the text doesn't tell us where Thomas was. But this is the first time reading this text that I realized the significance of the fact that Thomas was not locked inside that room with those disciples. Now, maybe he was hiding somewhere else. We don't know. But I want to entertain the idea, have an imagination, that maybe Thomas wasn't as overwhelmed with fear as the disciples were. We don't know. I'm just speculating. But the point is, Thomas wasn't there. So the disciples share the news with him, and he says, great story, guys, but you know what? I will not believe it unless I get to touch and see the scars that Christ bears. Thomas needed his own personal experience. He needed confirmation, evidence that what the disciples said was true. Now, I want you to just think about a time or a situation when you were asked to provide proof. Because that's what Thomas needs. Thomas needs proof. So think about um, uh, throughout your, your lives, your daily life, when you need to offer proof. So when you're pulled over, anybody been pulled over? Actually, anybody not been pulled over? Maybe we should say that. Oh, wow, okay. We have a I've never been pulled over club here. <laughs> wow, and maybe you could give us all some driving lessons or something. Uh, when you're pulled over, you're asked to show your license and registration, right? Prove that this is your car. Prove your identity. Uh, you're carded if you're buying something that uh, requires you to be over the age of 18 or 21 to prove your birth date. Uh, in order to prove that you're a citizen, you got to have a birth certificate. And you know what? You can't get a passport without one of those. There are all sorts of uh, official ID cards and badges and credentials and diplomas and insurance cards and wills and divorce documents and marriage certificates. All these things to prove you are who you say you are and that you have the credentials that you say you have and that you did the work or something happened to you. All of these things are proof, evidence. And our society loves proof, right? We really like proof. We like confirmation. And you know, proof was a hot topic during the 2020 election, wasn't it? Proof. And the truth is that we trust some sources more than others, right? Everyone's got their favorite um, news outlet that they trust. And, and when someone tells you something, if it's someone you really trust, you are more inclined to believe them, right? Because you have that foundation of trust. Now, the third question uh, I want you to uh, reflect on is, what do you accept or believe without proof? This is hard. Phil and I workshop this one too. What do you accept or believe without needing proof? Eternal life. Thank you, John. Thank you. Does anybody else have one they want to share? It's a hard one, so it's okay if, if you don't. What do you accept or believe without proof? God. Who your family and your friends are? It's an interesting question to think about, isn't it? Might tell you something about yourself, whatever the answer is to that question. So hold on to that one and ponder that. What, what do you believe or accept without proof and why? Now, um, a week later, on the eighth day after Jesus had risen and the tomb was empty, Jesus again appears to the disciples, and guess where they are? Locked inside the house. Locked inside the house. But this time, Thomas is there with them. 
And when Jesus sees Thomas, he invites him to have his own experience. He invites Thomas to touch the scars and to believe. Because the scars that Jesus bears from the nails and the mark on his side from the spear are proof, are proof of inexperience, are proof of Jesus' suffering, and therefore proof that he is who he says he is. And one of the questions that you're going to be invited to reflect on during the um, interactive time is right up here, and it's uh, what, oh no, I'm, is this one back here. It's what scars do you bear? What scars do you bear? And I invite you to interpret that however you'd like. There's already a couple examples of there to write it down and hang that up there in the back. What scars do you bear? Our scars remind us of what we have survived. And we have not just physical scars, but emotional and psychological scars, right? From the trauma and abuse that some of us have experienced. Thomas believed because he had his own experience. He had seen Jesus. He had touched the scars. And Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And here's the thing, I don't think that this was purely a dig at Thomas, because Thomas has kind of got a bad rap for doubting, right? But, but I think that when Jesus says, you know, you believe because you've seen, you've had this intimate experience with me in the flesh and blood, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Earlier in the text, that first time that Jesus appeared to the disciples, he said, as God sent me, I am sending you. So maybe what Jesus was saying to Thomas and the disciples when he said, blessed are those who have not seen, is that I am sending you to share this with others. Because Jesus was leaving. He was not going to be around in the flesh and blood anymore. He breathed on the disciples the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that was the presence of God in them to help them go out and share. It's kind of like saying, this is not going to be easy. But there will be people who will believe because of your witness. And they will be blessed because of your witness. Part of what is so disorienting about the resurrection is that it's new. New life, clean slate, another chance. Sounds great, right? But we still bear the scars. And part of our witness to those who have not had that personal encounter and experience with Christ is to bear and show those scars because they are proof of our own resurrection and the new life that we have found in Christ. So I've been thinking about uh, scars and particularly the scars of our institution, the church with a capital C. Uh, we have uh, scars from our past, scars from segregated seating, scars from not ordaining women, scars from the exclusion and rejection of LGBTQIA plus people. In fact, some of those aren't even scars, they're still open wounds, right? Scars from keeping secrets and covering up scandals, scars from abuse of power. And these scars remind us that there was and is life beyond the grave. Life beyond that socially constructed, self-made tomb of racism and misogyny and homophobia and transphobia and ageism. Our scars are a reminder that there is new life to be found and experienced and lived. And while they represent our suffering and brokenness, they also represent our healing. Our healing. May we, who have been empowered by the Holy Spirit and sent out by Christ, be willing to share our scars with one another as a sign that we have survived and that resurrection is possible, new life, the tomb is in fact empty. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. You'll have uh, an opportunity now to fill out those prayer cards. 
and I'll be uh, collecting them. And if you're joining us online, make sure you drop your prayer requests in this chat, and we will be sure to include them. Uh, we're we're going to sing um, one of my favorite songs, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God. Let us sing. You know, one of the things that, that I've experienced, and I know some of you have experienced, those of you that have shared this with me, is that it's in those vulnerable moments that, that are often the places we hide out of our fear or, or um, whatever. Uh, it's those vulnerable moments that, that allow us to experience the presence of the Holy more deeply. And what's scary about that is that the more vulnerable you are, the more at risk you are for harm to befall you. But the more vulnerable you are, the more exposed you are to the possibility of receiving the love and grace of Christ. And so uh, as we gather and we pray with one another, I'll invite you to uh, flip to the next slide so we can see the responses. Um, we'll pray with one another, we'll name aloud our joys, and we'll name aloud our concerns. And the reason we name these aloud is because it's a way that we're vulnerable with one another. It's a way that we open ourselves up to one another and God, and it's a way that we draw closer to each other and closer to the holy. And so I'm going to read each joy, and I'm going to say, God is good, and you're going to respond with all the time. 
And then for each concern, uh, I'm going to say all the time, and you're going to receive that concern and respond with, God is good. And we've been doing this for a few weeks, and so those of you who this may be your first time with us, um, just know that as we read a concern, to say God is good might sting a little bit, but the point is for us to proclaim that God is good even in our pain, even when we are in hiding. So it's okay that it hurts. We turn our attention first to the joys among us. For a new job, God is good all the time. Uh, for Matthew and Jennifer's birthdays today, happy birthday. I love that you share a birthday. God is good all the time. Uh, for an aunt doing much better after a long illness, God is good all the time. For family visiting, God is good all the time. For all the members who take part in our worship service, God is good. For spring, oh, and the sun, God is good all the time. For family and friends and this church, God is good all the time. We now turn our attention to the concerns among us. For our young people and the decisions that they face, all the time, God is good. For health concerns and those needing healing all the time, God is good. For those uh, facing cancer all the time, God is good. For people experiencing violence all the time, God is good. For the aid workers who have been killed and for the excessive killing of journalists, all the time. For everyone who is traveling this week on spring break, all the time. I invite Carissa to come forward uh, and lead us in our prayer of confession. Now, prayer of confession is not something we do every week, and we're going to be doing this corporately because it's something about the sound of our voices when we read responsively together. In the same way we sing and it echoes through the rafters, the same is said with spoken word. And so as we're reading this prayer of confession, you might read the words and you might think, I don't need to confess that. Guess what? It's not just about you. It's also about the person sitting next to you, and it's about who we are as a collective and as the body of Christ. So I invite you now to read responsibly this prayer of confession that Carissa will lead us in. Let's pray. O oh, Holy One, who gives life to the dead and calls formless potential into fullness of being, we feel your tug to realize a resurrection. God, we confess that though the tomb is empty, we are still afraid. So we hide in self-made tombs, tombs of pity, tombs of shame, tombs of guilt, tombs of anger. We cut ourselves off from fully experiencing the joy of new life, and instead we hide. We hide our truth, we hide our anxiety, we hide our depression, we hide our pain, but we cannot hide from you. You break out of the tomb and find us. You are with us and within us. Remind us that we are free. Let us pray. Risen Christ, Bust open the cold tombs of made-up minds. Massage our hardened hearts into supple softness. Grant us the mind of Christ and the courage of the Spirit to become the people we were meant to be. Show us where we have erected walls of fear and convinced ourselves that they are not only necessary but sacred. Show us what we are pretending not to know on this sacred path of becoming. By God's grace, we are forgiven, loved, liberated, freed. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to move into uh, this time of utilizing these interactive prayer stations in the service. 
And if you're watching the clock, you know I go 75 minutes, so we got plenty of time for this and communion. Don't worry. And, and this is what you're, you're invited to do. We have two prayer stations in the back, one on an easel, uh, one up front, or one um, off to the side. And the one off to the side is the one with the tomb and the prompt is there. And there's also a fountain there. And the purpose of this is to do something tangible because doing something tangible helps you connect with your body. So it's a spiritual act, but, but remember the physical is also spiritual, right? So uh, the fountain there is for you to just put your fingers in the water and remember the name that God has given you, beloved, that name at your baptism. Um, and then we have a prayer station up here as well, a reflection station, and you're responding to that question we answered at the beginning. So if you didn't have a chance uh, to share your response, what are you afraid of? And I invite you to write that on the piece of paper, and then you can place it inside the baptismal font. Just drop it in there, which is that gold bowl uh, right behind that prayer station. We also have the candles here if you are invited to light uh, a candle as a way to offer your prayer. If you're joining us online, hopefully you've seen the instructions about making an at-home prayer station with things around your house. Take a picture of your prayer station and send it to me. You can email it to me uh, or the church office or text me uh, so we can see the prayer stations that you have made at home. So what's going to happen is you are just going to be invited for the next six minutes uh, to rise and walk to these prayer stations and engage them if you would like to. Um, and if you are somebody that um, uh, is not super mobile, have someone bring you a paper and pen. So look around for the people that might uh, need some uh, support as we walk uh, through this together. And then uh, if you finish everything and there's any time left after the six minutes, talk to someone. Ask someone, what did you think of that? What did you say about what scars you bear or what you're afraid of or what do you hide from people? And just have a conversation, connect with one person. So um, God bless us as we move our bodies in an uh, act of prayer and worship through our conversation with one another, may we be blessed. So I invite you now, if you're joining us online, you've got that um, handout. For those of you in the sanctuary, I invite you to rise and uh, move and utilize those prayer stations and discuss with each other. I think my mic's still hot, Alex.
your way back to your seats and those of you who are still um, finishing up, please take your time and if you haven't been able to get to all of this uh, prayer stations and respond, um, please feel free to do that during, during one of the songs. Uh, this morning we gather, we gather around God's table, uh, God's, God's table that uh, is so expansive, uh, so wide, there is a seat for everyone. There is a seat for everyone, and there's no uh, conditions, regardless of who you are, what you hide from, the scars you bear, regardless of what you believe about God or don't believe about God, there is a seat for you at God's table. And all you got to do is come and receive. And you know, being open to receiving can actually be really hard, especially if we've been hurt. But the gift of communion, the bread and cup, is a means of God's grace. And through this ritual act of eating the bread and drinking the cup, we, again, the tangible, we are acknowledging and embodying that grace and the spiritual sustenance as well as the physical sustenance, the bread of life, the cup of love gives us. Jesus gathered with his disciples uh, just before he died and they shared a meal together, and during that meal, he took an ordinary loaf of bread. It was nothing special. He took an ordinary loaf of bread, and he broke the bread, and he gave thanks to God, and he said, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you, the bread of life. As often as you eat this bread, remember me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to God and shared it with his disciples and said, this is the cup of love. This is my life blood poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink this cup, remember me. Let us pray. Oh God, we come to your table this morning from different places and seasons and chapters of our own life in different places on our spiritual journey. And you welcome each and every one of us, those of us that have a heavy heart, who are grieving the loss of a loved one, who are dealing with uh, an incurable diagnosis, who are navigating caring for family or friends, those of us who are struggling with addiction, who are deeply depressed or riddled with anxiety, who are unemployed, who are struggling to navigate their marriage and their relationships, who are lonely. Oh God, those of us that have heavy hearts, we come to your table and we ask for you to lighten the load. Soothe our broken hearts with your grace that we receive through the bread and cup. And for those of us, oh God, that are having a mountaintop moment, that are in a season of awakening and self-discovery, that are celebrating and giving thanks for the joy and goodness of this life, give us humility and gratitude that we would remember what Christ did for us and what Christ calls us to do for each other. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on these gifts of bread and cup. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be the hands and feet of Christ for the world, sent out to witness, to bear our scars, to proclaim that those we meet might have their own encounter and experience with you. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, who loves us, who died and rose, who shows us the way. And we pray together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father and Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, 
the glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Uh, for those of you in person, here's how communion is going to work this morning. Uh, you'll be invited to um, exit the pews from the side aisles, and you can come up front here and receive the elements and go down the middle. Or if you're in the back uh, half of the sanctuary, same thing. We have a communion table set up in the back. You're invited to exit from the side aisles, go to the back, and then return to your seat down the front aisle. If you uh, do not want to get up and walk, um, fine, no problem. We are ready to come and serve you wherever you are. So just raise your hand, um, and a guide will, um, will a st communion steward uh, will see you, um, and we will be sure to come and serve you. And this is what we're going to do. When you come to the table this morning, there's, there's going to be a cup, and, um, and you're going to pick up the cup, and you're going to pick up the bread, and then uh, you're going to turn to the person uh, behind you, and they are going to offer you communion and to say the words. So you're going to pick it up yourself because we're trying, you got a little cup of juice, a little cup of bread. So we're really trying to be aware of the germs floating around. But then you're going to turn to, to uh, the person as they receive communion and you're going to say the bread of life and the cup of love. So could I get, um, could I, could we model this? Oh, you're ready? Okay, I've got my, I forgot I have models here. Okay. Okay, so let's model if you'll stand right here, okay, so um, go ahead and you pick up the bread in the cup and then turn to Rachel so she can see you, okay, and then you will say the words to her. That's on the screen. There's a screen back there. And then Rachel will receive. Go ahead, yep, okay. This is good so that everyone can know exactly what happens. This is good. Okay. And then really, you will turn to the person behind you as they pick it up, but there we go. Thank you. Yep, yep. The whole, the whole point is that, um, is that you, you are serving the other person communion. So ideally, if uh, the world wasn't germy, you'd be picking it up and handing it to them, but we're cutting that out. Um, but you turn, look the person in the eye, say to them, the bread of life, the cup of love. Screen here, screen here, screen there. Even if you fumble the words, it's the intent that matters, okay? And so as we, uh, as we do this, we are going to be singing the song, One Bread, uh, One Body. Oh, I guess the words, this won't be on the screen if we sing. Sorry. Um, bread of life, cup of love. You can even say bread cup. How about that? <laughs> the bread and cup of Christ, right? So we're going to be singing together uh, One Bread, One Body. And if you're joining us online, I hope now is the time you will receive the elements, the bread of life, the cup of love. Uh, let us come. The table has been made ready. Let us receive. Yeah, I think.
our most vulnerable moments, spiritually, materially, relationally, Christ manifests in community embrace, in shared food, in listening ears, in acts of solidarity and moral witness. Let us bring our offerings together so that we may meet and be met by the living Christ. You can make a financial contribution to the Ministries of Tibbetts online through our website or by placing your gift in the offering plate at the back of the sanctuary when you exit. We invite you now to stand and sing the doxology. uncertainties, skepticisms, and the great aches that leave us cynical about change. Meet our vulnerabilities with your own, O God. Root our faith not in coercion nor suppression, but in authentic connection and solidarity, that we may rise as a community to the calling of these days. Amen. 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 I'll invite you to remain standing. I just have a brief announcement for you. We'll have fellowship hour following the service hosted by Patrick in the parlor, and so I hope you'll join us for that. If you haven't subscribed to our weekly announcements, go to the website and do that. Top right-hand corner, uh, click subscribe. Uh, we're going to be doing um, these interactive prayer stations for the next uh, three weeks, this week and two weeks after this, and they'll build on each other. So as you uh, come to worship or tune in online, uh, this has a potential to be a very meaningful and spiritually formative experience for you. Uh, if you can open yourself up to that. And my hope is that what might have felt a little strange or awkward today, uh, by the time we get to the third Sunday, uh, you might loosen up a little bit, right? <laughs> and you know what? It's okay if things are clunky and awkward. It's part of being human, and it's how we grow and how we learn. And this is about learning about ourselves. That's one of the things Christ calls us to do. Uh, we're going to be singing Amazing Grace as our closing song. Uh, we're going to sing four verses of this. And just so you know, um, the last two verses we're singing a cappella, and that is intentional. So sing out. Sing out. This is a song that um, uh, many of us know and love, an anchor of the faith. Uh, and don't be afraid when that piano drops out to get a little bit louder, okay? Okay, let's sing.
have given us the Holy Spirit and send us out. When we are in hiding, when we are stowed away in self-made tombs, meet us there with your grace, your love. Meet us and may we receive the gift of a personal experience of the resurrected Christ and may that invite us, compel us to share with others. In your holy and mysterious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Grab a cup of coffee. Hey, thank you, thank you. Oh, my mic's still hot. Thank you both. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to I wanna tell you, um, Jennifer's going to play guitar next week. And so if you're interested in singing next week, her and I are, are, won't choose the songs probably till Tuesday because she's out of town. If my mic is hot, can you turn me off? Can you turn me off?